right, the attendee count has stabilized. So I'm going to take that as my cue to, uh, to get us started. Um, I'm uh, Michael Atlinger, welcome everybody. I'm the director of the Carsey School of Public Policy at the University of New Hampshire. Um, we're here to discuss the first 100 days of the presidency of Joe Biden, uh, a topic that he himself will be addressing uh, tomorrow night before a joint session of Congress. We'd originally scheduled this for tomorrow night, but uh, we thought we couldn't handle the competition for your attention, so we moved it to tonight. Um, so thank you all, uh, everybody who uh, followed us to, to this time slot. Um, so President Biden took office with a lot on his plate. Uh, his predecessor and his predecessor's uh, uh, supporters had challenged the legitimacy of the election results uh, to an unprecedented extent. Uh, the new president outlined a set of four crises that he set uh, for his administration to address, uh, COVID, um, a unique economic recession, escalated demands for racial equity, and a do or die moment on climate change. Uh, he has passed the American Rescue Plan to address COVID and the recession. He has the American Jobs Plan uh, and is about to unveil the American Families Plan, uh, both of which address longstanding challenges facing the economy and American families, uh, both of which also address, um, to, to, in other ways, uh, longstanding issues of equity and climate change. Of course, there are disagreements about whether these four crises are all crises, um, uh, whether they are the priority issues he should be addressing, and to the extent they are, whether the administration's approaches are the best. Um, tonight, we plan to analyze uh, all that more than debate it. Um, there's certainly other channels for you to hear debate on all, on all of that. Um, we have a terrific panel uh, uh, to do that, uh, consisting of an esteemed UNH faculty member, Ellen Fitzpatrick, an outstanding postdoctoral scholar in Ryan Gibson, uh, and two UNH uh, alum who are highly accomplished and continue to give back to the university, which we much appreciate, uh, Rich Ashu and Ellen Nissen. I'll uh, introduce them more fully as we go along, but for more details uh, on their excellence, you can look at the uh, website webpage for this event, and you can, and you can um, link to, and you can, there are links to their, to their bios. Um, I'm going to start by asking some questions myself of the panelists to get us going. If you have the audience have any questions, click on there's a Q and A uh, button link uh, located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you click on that, it'll open up a separate window that you can type in any questions that you might have, and we'll try to get to them. All right. Without further ado, we'll get going, and I'm going to start with you, Ellen. Um, Thank you for being here, uh, Ellen, as a renowned and award-winning historian here at UNH, uh, who is often asked uh, for your perspectives by really most of the country's leading major media outlets at one time or another, um, and your perspectives specifically on current events and how they relate to modern American history, uh, and also as someone who's studied and written about the presidency, maybe you could start us out with like why 100 days? You know, why, why are we focusing on this now? Is, this, is there a precedent for this or is it a new thing? Is it in the constitution? Why 100 days? Well, every president since Franklin Roosevelt has been dogged by this uh, period of analysis once uh, their 100 days have passed because Franklin Roosevelt uh, came into office, of course, uh, in March of 1933 in a terribly low point in the Great Depression. And um, he, within a hundred days, uh, was able to put through uh, a series of legislative acts with the, uh, obviously the Congress put them through, but he introduced them. And in cooperation with the Congress, they really began a process of revolutionizing the relationship between the federal government and the rest of the nation. It was an extraordinarily productive period. Um, some 15 pieces of major legislation were passed. And um, I won't itemize them all, but I would say that most of us uh, still feel the effects of the changes that occurred uh, during Franklin Roosevelt's first 100 days. Uh, uh, just to give you a, a few examples of uh, the legislation that was passed, the Tennessee Valley Authority 
was established in those first hundred days. The Glass-Steagall Act, which created the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation was created in the first hundred days. The Truth and Securities Act was passed, which began the process of having the federal government regulate the stock market. Franklin Roosevelt took the United States off the gold standard with the Economy Act, uh, which closed the banks briefly and what Roosevelt euphemistically called a holiday and then reopened a third of the banks in the country uh, that were deemed by the federal government to be safe and encouraged depositors that it, they could now bring their money back into banks that they were safe. It's been said, uh, one, one of Roosevelt's advisors said that uh, it, in this uh, period that capitalism was saved in eight days as a result of some of these measures that Roosevelt took. And of course, there were a series of relief, uh, public relief and employment programs that were passed as well. So it was a period of extraordinary activism. And the contrast with today, the comparison of course, is with this terrible uh, pandemic that we're living through and the challenges they have imposed upon the American people. The contrast, of course, is that um, it was said then that um, it, of, of the Congress, that the Congress forgot to be Democrats and Republicans. They banded together to cooperate and to assist Roosevelt in doing all of this. So that's the 100 days. Um, in July, when the 100 days were passed, Roosevelt sat back, gave a fireside chat to the nation and said, let's look back on this 100 days that have gotten the wheels of the New Deal spinning. And so uh, that was uh, in part uh, where the reference comes from. Uh, but it was echoed by Walter Lippmann, who also described the country prior to Roosevelt's 100 days as being uh, terribly divided, uh, really on the verge of anarchy and that in a hundred days, Roosevelt had helped to restore the nation's faith in itself. So it's a pretty high standard to meet and no president has done so since. So you, I just, one quick follow-up. You had, you said July. So this was before they moved inauguration day to the, to the earlier. No, he was inaugurated in March, but in right. July, he looked right. back to that first hundred days. He had called the Congress back into session as soon as he became president. And the Economy Act, which took uh, the nation off the gold standard and closed the banks briefly and then reopened them under federal supervision, I think was uh, passed by the Congress, signed by the president and enacted into law in a single day. It's, it's unfathomable when you think about what has uh, been happening over the last uh, decade or so in American political life. So Ella, um, you're the Vox White House reporter, or, or is this, uh, are you seeing this wonderful, uh, you know, bipartisan unity behind the president? And uh, uh, I won't even make you answer that question. Uh, <laughs> but I, I will say what, what, let me ask you this. Um, it's going to be a list that's far shorter than Roosevelt's, but let, what would you say, just from the administration's point of view, they think of as their two or three things to, that they've accomplished you know, successfully in this 100 days? Sure. Well, I mean, I think obviously the first one and probably the most pivotal one is, is COVID. Um, that, you know, that is the thing that we have all been uh, living through collectively over the past year. That is the thing that has been top of everyone's mind just on, you know, when, when, when will this end? When can we resume some semblance of normalcy again in our lives? Um, and so, you know, I think, and especially, um, you know, certainly the, the Trump administration does deserve some credit for, for Operation Warp Speed and at least the beginning of the vaccine program. But as far as, you know, rolling it out um, and just Trump's messaging himself, I think the combination of getting, you know, a really large vaccine distribution program up and running nationwide and also um, kind of doing it in a way, I think in a real contrast to Trump that almost sort of undersold it initially and set 
you know, that I feel like the Biden administration's approach has been um, setting targets that they know that they can hit that, you know, sound really great, especially uh, compared to uh, the last four years when, you know, President, former President Trump was saying, you know, I, this is going to be the best, this is going to be the greatest. Um, you know, President Biden initially set uh, a target of 100 million shots in arms in the first 100 days, which uh, he got there on day 58. Um, and it's just been, you know, ratcheting that up further. And I, you know, I think I certainly, you know, I feel like everybody I know personally at this point has either gotten uh, their first or second vaccine dose or is scheduled to get a vaccine dose. So that's something that really, um, noticeable impact in people's lives. The other thing too that goes hand in hand with that is the economy. Um, certainly, you know, the first part of um, Biden's economic program, at least as far as relief goes, is done with the American Rescue Plan. And it was, um, I was really interested to hear Professor Fitzpatrick talk about Franklin Roosevelt's first 100 days, because certainly there is not that pace of legislation right now. But also, there is this very interesting um, look at, you know, the Biden administration is just really thinking big in, in what it's doing. There is no sort of uh, quibbling around the edges at this point. There's no, I mean, certainly they are projecting that they want to work with Republicans in Congress. Um, bipartisan talks are, are happening uh, on the infrastructure plan. But I think, you know, a lot of Democrats that I've talked to on Capitol Hill think that this is probably going to go via budget reconciliation and that De Biden and Democrats um, really want to pass big policies that have measurable impact on American lives. They really want to make sure that the economy is, um, is, is going big um, and is going great guns. And, and that is definitely number one and number two. Um, there's a lot, <laughs> there's so much else. There's immigration, um, there is, you know, background checks, there's um, climate change, there's a big climate summit that just happened. But um, I think that Biden and his administration are really measuring uh, his 100 day success on COVID and the economy. COVID, I think, you know, they feel very good about the economy it might be off to a good start, but there is a lot yet to go on his jobs plan and the American Families Plan, which we should be seeing tomorrow. Yeah, and we'll get back to some of those other subjects. I mean, just uh, to be clear, the, the, the point of going through reconciliation is that you don't need 60 votes to, to get cloture and get to a vote, a final vote in the Senate. And the, the, the Senate is 50-50 with the vice president casting the uh, tie-breaking vote. So, that's how the Democrats can get stuff through without Republican votes. So if they're going to do it through reconciliation, it means they're kind of, you know, it sounds like your people on the Hill don't think that those Republican votes will, will be there or they'll be able to make the package attractive enough for them to, to support it. So let's turn to you, Rich. Um, you've been involved in policy for quite a while, um, initially working as a Senate staffer for Warren Rudman for six years. Um, government relations on the private side for a long time as a candidate for Congress, um, as the U.S. Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Export Administration in the Trump administration, and now back in the private sector working for, as Vice President uh, of, I want to get this right, Vice President of Go Global Government Affairs for LAM Research Corporation, a very significant corporation that people haven't heard of, I might add. Um, uh, so you focused a great deal on trade and on national security in your career. And, you know, what are you seeing uh, in, in terms of those areas from this, how this administration is positioning itself on those issues? You know, what are you seeing from, from where you sit? Yeah, thanks, Michael. I, so I think the most, probably the most remarkable thing to me, you know, people have a tendency to look at contrasts between the current administration and, and any that might have come before a lot of comparisons are made to the Obama administration, obviously the Trump administration. Uh, I think what's been what's been notable uh, to me is uh, how much has not changed with respect to uh, China, uh, because uh, you'll hear um, almost any public policy watcher uh, say that that China, you know China is the issue of the day. Obviously, we have our old friends. Uh, you know, the Russians and, and, and certainly Iran continues to pose a challenge uh, and, and North Korea has been disturbingly quiet, uh, but, but China is, is, is there and impacts everything. And yet we have not seen a major 
shift. And in fact, you know, while it is still early, one may, you know, leading indicator for an administration that's, that's still early uh, is to look at uh, the people, you know, who, who are they bringing in? And uh, while that is still early, the Senate confirmed ranks are still not anywhere close to being filled out. Uh, those that have been chosen to come in, and you're certainly familiar with that dynamic, uh, they, they reflect actually quite a hawkish stance on China, which has been, uh, been kind of notable to me. And, in, 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 and the administration's been drawing on a lot of ranks from uh, think tank communities where opinions are, 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 are put out quite publicly. And so that's one area where, where I think it's, it's notable to see not only the, uh, one could even say continuity, where, where many of the same attitudes seem to exist. One could also argue uh, the issues have been, uh, I'd say issues of concern have been increased. Well, the prior administration certainly took some steps with respect to human rights in China. This administration is really doubling down on that and finding many allies in Congress which is also unique. So that is one area where I think it's, um, it's, it's notable to see the administration really have the confidence in uh, you know, what its concerns are and to not be as concerned about contrasting with any prior administration. Hmm, interesting, thanks. Um, Ryan, so you are as a, you're a postdoctoral scholar in sociology uh, at, at UNH. Um, and you study, among other things, the psychology of race and racism. And I'm sure you've thought a lot about how this administration has addressed issues related to race, um, especially given how publicly elevated you know, uh, racial equity was in the years leading into the election. And also because of you know, President Biden's, the importance of, of, of the constituency to President Biden's election. Um, so what are you seeing so far in terms of that being reflected in, in what the administration's done in its first hundred days? Yeah, it's a great question. And thanks again for having me here. Um, I sort of would give Biden two grades if I'm allowed to separate it out. I, he said that his four, you know, areas, COVID, the economy, climate, and race relations. And that's a, a interesting word. So I'm going to give him two sort of scores. Uh, a race relations score, which I would sort of describe as the public relations element of dealing with racial issues and racial dialogue in the United States, I would give pretty good grade. I would probably say an A minus. Um, I think that when we saw the uptick in hate crimes related to COVID at the early part of his administration, he took swift public action. Um, when the Atlanta spa shootings took place, we saw you know a conservative, a conservative sort of effort on his part to sort of stay restrained, but nonetheless meet the challenges of senators like Tammy Duckworth, who were wanting more representation in Congress. They were able to solve issues like that pretty quickly. And I would give the administration credit for being nimble when it comes to dealing with issues as they come up. I mean, just recently, we finished the trial of Derek Chauvin. I think a lot of people were expecting uh, the doomsday apocalypse to occur. And I think the administration actually handled everything quite well in terms of public optics. That being said, <laughs> and this I'm sure will come up with other people, the grade we're gonna give the first 100 days when it comes to actually addressing racial equity structurally and fixing and changing the rules, I would give, I guess an incomplete, you know, cause we haven't really gotten there yet, but it's not just not there yet. I would describe it as like that student who's asking basic questions before the final exam. And you're like, you're getting an incomplete, but you're still, I don't know, I'm worried about you. Um, as we're seeing with the American Rescue Plan, as Ella mentioned, we had reconciliation, as you mentioned as well. With the American Jobs Plan, it also looks like that might be reconciliation. And the major, major issues of structural racial reform, like the George Floyd Policing Act or the John Lewis Voting Rights Act or the For the People Act. These are things that cannot be passed through reconciliation. And I have really yet to see any evidence that they're going to be able to pull together a coalition to get some of these major structural reforms as they relate to race and racism through. So I'm a little skeptical about that in the first 100 days. I'm not quite sure how they're going to make that work. But so I guess an incomplete on that score. And that would be how I describe, I think, so far the first 100 days. I'm not giving any grades. Um, <laughs> Alan, let me, you know, I think all three of the other panelists either explicitly or implicitly kind of 
talked about how Biden, you know, re Biden relative to what has just come before. And I'm wondering, you know, if you could give us a little perspective on, so when FDR came in, um, just as since you raised that as a touchstone, you know, Hoover had been the president before. Was he deliberately trying to contrast himself? Did he ever say Hoover's name? You know, um, which Biden kind of rather obviously is avoiding. Um, uh, you know, what was that? What was that dynamic? Well, he didn't really have to say Hoover's name. It was on the lips of many, many Americans. The unemployment like rate. <laughs> the unemployment rate. Uh, yes, exactly. Was twenty five percent. In, uh, in March of 1933, when FDR was inaugurated. And uh, Hoover's name had become a synonym, actually, for uh, people who had, you know, were camping out in the streets and uh, uh, living in what were called Hoovervilles and newspapers, using newspapers for warmth, which were called Hoover blankets. I mean, it was, uh, you know, it was pretty disastrous. And Roosevelt himself, the interesting thing about him was that he was incredibly cheerful and affirmative in the midst of all of this. He famously, of course, said in his inaugural, we had nothing to fear but fear itself. And um, he was uh, very, um, you know, cheerful and affirmative with the American uh, people. So the other, you know, point of contrast, of course, is that he had won the election in an absolute landslide, carrying, you know, 42 states, um, I think 57% a, a, a of the popular vote. And he had a mere 200 seat majority in the House behind him. Uh, so, you know, he, um, he had, he was coming into an utter disaster with the goodwill of uh, his, uh, of the Congress to work with him, as I said previously, but also of the American people. And I suppose one thing I would say um, about Biden in this, in this context is that it seems to me that he is also very much invoking, again, the power of the federal government, of the, uh, the nation itself, to be the uh, the um, source of solutions to these problems. Of course, during the pandemic, President Trump, you know, was uh, putting a lot of emphasis on the states to deal with the COVID pandemic. And, you know, he set in motion some important things that have helped us to, um, and particularly the research that was done to come up with vaccines and the support for that. But you're seeing again, uh, Biden has actually, I just saw something today that said that he was second only to FDR thus far in um, issuing executive orders, statements, documents, symbolic uh, uh, papers of one sort or another uh, that really again is encouraging Americans to look to the national government for solutions. And uh, that I think is a point of comparison actually. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, I mean, one thing that's interesting is that Biden is not following an anti, like a small government Republican per se. I mean, that was not, you know, Trump's main argument unlike other Republicans who run for president who are, or mm -hmm. who you know, really in Congress and whatever he that that was not where he was coming from. So I think that's, you know, it's sort of it's 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 a different dynamic maybe than we've seen when other democratic presidents have come in. I just quickly say I was once in Spain when the unemployment rate was 25% and the government's approval rating was 20%. Mm -hmm. And my brilliant analysis was that was not a recipe for political success. So <laughs> and it wasn't. But um so Ella, I, I sort of asked you what the big claims to fame at this point that the, that the White House and, and President Biden would focus on. Um, on the other hand, you know, even the best script for the first hundred days bumps up against harsh realities and, and uh, you know, plans go awry. What do you think, you know, where do you think the Biden administration has been most pushed off script or, 
you know, kind of fumbled the ball a little bit in what they were trying to accomplish. Yeah, I think uh, I think immigration is probably the number one thing, and it's going to be interesting to see um, if this uh, becomes an issue, if Republicans make this an issue in the 2022 midterms, which I think is pretty likely. Um, but I think the biggest thing as far as, you know, going off script um, was, you know, when, when the White House uh, had announced that it would keep uh, the Trump uh, era refugee cap in place, um, which had been a reversal from a, a higher target that they had set. And then there was, you know, huge outcry from uh, from Democrats and Congress and and uh, advocate advocacy groups. Um, and then they reversed reversed the reversal um, and and put the higher refugee cap in place. Um, and I think that there have been a few instances. I mean, Biden is kind of famously known as somebody who can sometimes go off script when he's, uh, you know taking taking uh, questions at a press conference or or giving a speech. You know, he he uh, not not to the extent that Trump was, certainly, but he, you know he's a plain spoken guy and and he says what he believes. and sometimes he'll say something and then, uh, his his aides will uh, say that that's not in line with the White House position. Um, and uh, I think that there have been a few instances, uh, notably that that uh, you know situation around the refugee cap and also some of the reporting around the uh, decision to pull troops of, out of Afghanistan, where I think that Biden has sort of overruled um, some of his his top people giving him advice and has essentially you know made made a decision on his own um, whether for political purposes whether it's because he just believes that's the right thing to do um, he was very adamant uh, on the Afghanistan decision which is one where Democrats supported him Republicans um, did did not as much but I think that there have certainly been situations where, you know, at the end of the day, he is the last person who gets to make the decision. And some of those decisions have, haven't necessarily been in line with, with some of his top advisors. Um, but on the immigration issue, I mean, immigration, as Biden is finding out, certainly is an enormously complicated topic. It's, uh, it's been tough, you know, it's been a situation for um, every president to deal with. Obama uh, had to deal with it. Trump uh, certainly uh, has his legacy tied to, to that. And, um, you know, Biden is running into kind of the confluence of the effect of the Trump era immigration policies now being um, somewhat over, or at least the perception of those being over among um, migrants in Central America um, who, you know, want to come to the United States if, if there's a chance that they will be um, let in um, or processed uh, more humanely. Um, but there's, you know, still a global pandemic happening. There are still uh, rules that were set in place during the Trump administration that Biden is continuing to limit the number of people coming in um, due, to, due to COVID. Um, and so now there are situations where, um, you know, families uh, can, can also in effect be split up because children can come through, but adults cannot. Um, and it's, it's an enormously difficult situation. It's driven by natural disasters in Central America and hurricanes and economic stability. Um, and all of these things that are, you know, sort of deep underlying problems. Um, and it's not as easy to, you know, just you can't snap your fingers and fix it from one administration to the next. Um, so I think that that is, is number one. Um, and as I said, you know, I think that this is something that Republicans um, could very well message on um, into 2022. And it'll be interesting to see how they do that. Yeah, um, just a, a follow up on that. I mean, on Afghanistan, you know, he believes what he believes and he made the call. The refugee flip-flop, that wasn't him saying something at a press conference that was off message. That was, weren't those all like pretty much official announcements? I mean, do you have any sense of what happened there? Uh, you know, because it was very strange. It was a strange thing for them to, I thought, for them to roll back of all the things they might have done. Yeah, I mean, I uh, admittedly, our, our immigration reporter follows this more closely than I do. But, um, you know, I think that that, you know, from from reporting, I think it's it's kind of a struggle um, between, you know, political optics and um, and also just just having to deal with a, a very tough situation and a very tough reality. Um, and I think that, you know, it's something that, you know, reporting uh, was that that Biden, you know, took a long time to make a decision on it. 
Um, and, you know, then, you know, kind of outruled or overruled uh, Secretary of State Tony Blinken, who had been advising him to, you know, sort of uh, raise the cap of, of refugees and, and decided to initially keep it um, at the, the Trump era level. And, um, you know, I, I some, some reporters and, and I had heard that this was sort of a situation where Biden kind of made the decision uh, himself at, at, the, at the last minute. And then uh, there was kind of the fallout from, from there. Um, but, you know, these, these are things where, again, it's, you know, there are a lot of smart people in the room, but sometimes things don't always go according to plan. Um, and that was definitely a moment where for a White House that is extremely on message, uh, especially compared to the previous administration, um, everything is rolled out very uh, cleanly usually that was the exception to the rule. Yeah, the lack of leaks must ruin some of your fun. Um, but uh, uh, Ryan, uh, you you also study immigration, actually. So you know, do you what's kind of what's your perspective on on how this has been happening, and you know what's been happening at the border? And you know, I do think one thing that's been kind of underappreciated is like how bad the situation is in a lot of these countries where people are coming from. Just you know, you can imagine going through pa a pandemic like this without the resources of the United States to backfill people's pocketbooks and all that. Um, so Ryan, I mean, what what's your... Yeah, um, immigration, especially in the United States context, it is one of those issues that really hits at the core of being American, which is why I think it always is so important and you see it come up in every election cycle, right? In, in the case of border crossings in the South, you're talking about issues of justice, issues of fairness, but also questions of deservingness and questions of security, um, which is a huge part of the American imagination about what's going on in the South, right? So I think what's happening here is, you know, one, I think Biden is a little bit underselling how crazy it actually got. Um, they tried to, Biden, I think, tried to describe it as like a fairly normal or seasonal uh, sort of uptick when it was a hundred and over 170,000 uh, apprehensions at the border. And that's not including the thousand or so getaways that they call them every day, right? So, but that's only a, a part of the reaction. I think where Biden actually has an opportunity and they have, and the administration hasn't stepped up yet is so often in what typically the, the right tend to do when it comes to immigration is talk about it in terms of security and the left talk about it in a very different type of way. But I think right now what's clear given the amount of families and unaccompanied minors that are crossing, it really should be a humanitarian focus. I mean, call it a crisis, but call it a humanitarian crisis, not a security crisis. Um, and, and, and talk about the resources necessary you can't, I was a little bit confused by, you know, oh, it's a seasonal normal thing. You've got the, the, the Department of Homeland Security calling in FEMA. That's okay. You know, like it's, it's COVID, it's a lot of issues all at once. But at the end of the day, I don't think the administration's framing it the right way in a way that I think would actually get the resources there that, that really do need to be there. So I think that there's a little bit of, um, I think he would rather have it not be a problem and unfortunately it is, and sort of watching how his administration and he himself are, are navigating that is fascinating to watch, but certainly not in the first 100 days have we seen anything concrete in terms of what the rules are gonna be legislatively. Of course, he passed more executive orders on immigration than any other issue in his first 100 days. That was his priority in terms of executive orders. And I, I think we're just only beginning to see what that's gonna pan out to be, but I think there's a messaging uh, issue that needs to be attenuated too. Yeah, I mean, he did send over legislation on on immigration, and there's of course the Dream Act. There's various reform acts floating there, but um, I mean, I do think one thing it's worth pointing out is that immigration actually does have a. They were never able to come to a deal, but there have been genuine bipartisan efforts to make progress on immigration, which kind of got sidelined, let's say, under President Trump. Um, it'll be interesting to see whether the Republicans who have been, who wanted to work on this, and there's been a decent number of them, uh, uh, you know, kind of are able to navigate sort of from kind of the Trump dominance of the issue on the Republican side back to where they were really. I mean, which isn't where Biden is, but there was, there was, you know, they were on. They were sure. I mean, I, and I think for better or for worse though, Trump, you know, 
he was president for a reason, right? I think whether it was you agreed with him or not, you knew exactly what he was about and you knew what he was trying to do with the border crisis. You knew his perspective, you knew his stance. You could guess for better or for worse what the administration's actions were gonna be. And right now, I, Democrats have had this problem historically, in particular, I think, during the Obama administration, but it's what is the clarity of the mission at the yeah. border? And I don't know exactly quite what that is yet from the Biden administration. What is the mission? What is the goal? How can they articulate that? Because as Ella said, if they're going to bring that in the midterms, um, you know, the, the, the message needs to be clear, and I'm not sure we're quite there yet. Yeah, no, good point. So, uh, uh, Rich, actually, this is, um, uh, so, yeah, so we got a question that relates to a question I was going to ask anyway, so that's good, um, which is, so one thing, you know, I, you, you made a good point about continuity with respect to China, but I just quickly, so Jake Sullivan was faculty at the Carsey School, he's now the National Security Advisor, and he gave a presentation before the Biden, you know, like, whatever, three years ago, two, three years ago, and, and uh, you know, what he was saying then was that, you know, whatever you think about the things we have to be adversarial with China on, there's also a bunch of things we need to work with them on as just two world powers. I mean, that's just, um, uh, you know, uh, the reality of it. So that was one half of it. And then the other point I'd be interested in hearing your response to was, also, whatever it is, we need to embrace our allies, you know, our traditional allies in whatever we do vis-a-vis -vis China. And I'm just, do you see any, you know, departure from Trump in that aspect of, or signs that that will be different? Yeah, there's no question um, that <clears throat> where it comes to China, where it comes down to the how. And uh, because, as I said, you're not going to find a whole lot of disagreement that, that China's an issue, China's doing some disturbing things. All I have to do is look at Hong Kong. Uh, we, have, we have to change our trade rules with respect to Hong Kong because they're now considered part of the mainland. That is a very profound uh, transformation, especially when you consider that, that uh, Taiwan is starting to experience some of the same, some of the same um, behaviors. And, and the question is, well, yeah, we can all agree that those things are, are a problem, but what are you gonna do about it? Uh, no question multilateralism is, is key to any constructive answer. Uh, and that is where the Trump administration uh, had, had trouble finding its footing. The, the, the Trump administration made a big deal out of, out of holding NATO's feet to the fire and, and actually doing some things that, that, uh, that, that were, were, were actually very challenging to Republican orthodoxy, like tariffs that were based on national security. Um, that upset our allies almost more than anything. And it's very hard to work together to, to contain China, but you, you have to do it. Remember, China is different than Russia. Russia was never the commercial economic power that China is. And that commercialism is exactly what unites our two countries. Uh, any damage you do economically to China will no question have, have impacts in the US and that has to be, that has to be brought into it. So, the, 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 you know, working with other nations is, is certainly key, uh, but acknowledging the economic relationships, um, if you want to turn this economy around and keep in mind, this administration, I think it was Ella who said how, how they're noted for their discipline. You know, the, the administration didn't want to talk about anything other than COVID. And I think that was probably the right emphasis in the first, in the first few months. And uh, they have become, as a result, a master of what I call summit politics, where you have a summit meeting, nothing gets done, but you've talked about the issue and you're able to kind of maintain the tempo you want to maintain. At some point, they're going to deal with China and we'll see what the, what the you know, what the how, what the how will look like, but that will be the key difference. Let me stick with you a second, because you, you mentioned something I wanted us to get into a little bit, which was trade policy. You know, you mentioned the tariffs and, you know, is it, do we know anything like, uh, do you have any sense of where trade policy is going under Biden based on the appointments and what they've done? Like, yeah, I'm just throw that out there. Too. Yeah, so it, I, I think it's important to not read too much in, um, in what we're, we just talked about three examples of continuity. Um, you know, uh, we, we talked immigration, how 
it, it's easier for the administration to kind of let that let it ride until you're able to deal with it on your terms. Uh, the tariffs, they're letting them ride until they can deal with them on their terms. I mean, we're seeing this a lot from this administration, which I think is 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 cagey and again a reflection of of discipline. Where they're going to go, I think we're probably going to see. Uh, a, a, a very robust debate internally, because if you were to look at the leading indicators that I mentioned, the people, there's all sides. There's yeah. decouplers, there's engagers. We had that in the last administration, we're gonna have it in this one. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I wanna, another question that's come up, which I also wanted to get to is, uh, so unity, um, you know, uh, President Biden, his inaugural address, emphasized us all getting together and solving our problems. And, you know, if you look at polling, the public, you know, wants people to, to get their leaders to get together and just solve problems and cut the politics out. Um, let me, I'd actually be interested in all of you kind of offering your, offering your perspectives on, uh, you know, how that's gone, you know, and whether the administration is serious about it whether the Republicans are in Congress are interested into it to the extent the public, you know, is involved in that, that question. Um, maybe I'll start with you, Ella, on that. Yeah, this is an excellent question. Um, one that I have been thinking about a lot. Um, so I actually have a piece out tomorrow uh, about sort of the politics of um, Biden, you know, going big um, on his policy and and sort of I I feel and I've, I've been talking to experts over the past few days about, um, you know, if if Biden is embracing going big on his politics too, um, because as like if you, if you look at who um, at least which constituencies are being targeted by his economic plans, it's it's everyone. You know, it's not. It's infrastructure, not just for, for men. There's a care economy portion for, for women. Um, there is a $400 billion provision for home health aides and long-term care workers who are predominantly, you know, black and brown women. And so it's it's Biden, I think, you know, in addition to doing what his economic advisors are, are you know pushing him to do as far as good policy, is also, I think, really sort of trying to respond to the needs of uh, a very diverse base of constituents. Um, and I think that he, so far, his administration, certainly when it came to the American Rescue Plan, um, I think cared more about what the public thought necess than necessarily like what Republicans in Congress thought. Um, and I think that that was partially driven by lessons of the Obama administration, which obviously Biden saw up close and personal as Obama's vice president, um, trying and um, a lot of times failing to work with uh, Mitch McConnell and Senate Republicans. Um, but also I think that I think that the events of January 6th and the uh, Capitol insurrection happening right before Biden's inauguration also had a really deep impact um, both on Biden and on Democrats in Congress. I mean, I remember um, being on Capitol Hill uh, a few weeks after that happened and talking to Democrats who were basically just saying, um, you know, lawmakers who are essentially saying that this was, a, you know, this is not just partisanship and political disagreements. This was a direct, you know, threat to my life and my family. And this is how I view, you know, at least the certainly Republican um, members of the House who still voted to um, decertify the election results. This really painted, um, uh, you know, this, this made tensions over there in, in Capitol Hill um, far worse and far more personal. Um, and so I think that, you know, it's going to be really interesting to see, and I don't know yet exactly how things are going to go as far as the infrastructure plan. Um, you know, certainly the Biden administration is telegraphing that, um, that infrastructure is different and they want bipartisan talks, they want some sort of unity. But at the same time, if you just look at the sheer price tag of um, the economic proposals altogether that, that they are proposing, it's, you know, something around you know like six trillion dollars um that is i see to me uh is is designed to you know really try to get people direct things that they can see in their own lives and respond to needs um that that you know some polls show are are broadly pretty popular in the country um rather than sort of getting bogged down in unity and bipartisanship on capitol hill 
And I don't know if that's going to work, but it's an interesting um, political theory to test out in the next few years. So Ellen, is there, uh, I mean, this is obviously very different than FDR, so I won't reference that to FDR, but are there like- Well, there I'm, not, I'm not so sure that it's so different okay. in point of fact, as I was listening to Ella, I was thinking that, you know, when people feel um, really the impact of government in improving their own lives uh, in a very direct way, that um, you know is a powerful thing. Uh, Fr Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal did not end the Great Depression. On the other hand, he was elected to another three terms. Um, and part of that was uh, the sense that people felt, uh, first of all, the economy did improve, uh, certainly until 1937. Um, and the fact that they felt that the government was working for them uh, and they could feel the impact of these big legislative programs. Not everybody, not universally, not equally, but very, very broadly and significantly. And um, that kind of, um, you know, that kind of uh, effectiveness, I think really uh, is uh, obviously it speaks for itself and particularly in the face of uh, the kind of standoffs that there have been and the way in which so many Americans have felt so uh, alienated really from the business of government that what's happening in Washington isn't really helping them. Remember this was Trump's pitch himself that he was thinking about uh, you know, working people and uh, trying to reach them and uh, who were forgotten by those in Washington. So um, I think that Roosevelt was quite successful in that way. I think it resonated. I think it, he had his critics on the left as, as well as does Biden um, and certainly on the right. Uh, but, you know, I think that uh, it's an interesting point of comparison when you think about the federal activism that Biden is really advancing here. You know, whether uh, how successful it will be, who knows? You know, you can't judge by the president's first hundred days how successful their presidency will be or how much the American people are going to like them. John F. Kennedy had a disastrous uh, first hundred days with the Bay of Pigs invasion was the worst uh, disaster in his presidency, which took place within, you know, I think 80 days. And yet um, at the first hundred day mark, he had the highest approval rating of any president in modern American history. 83% of the public approved of his performance, even after the disaster. And he had been elected by one tenth of 1% of the popular vote. So Obviously, all those people didn't like him on election day. So uh, a lot can change, uh, but you know, I think the public can also be quite forgiving. And in the midst of the pandemic, if Biden can start moving some things and making some things happen, I think that resonates with the public. Will yeah. resonate, I should say. I shouldn't make predictions. Historians are very bad at that, but. Kennedy had some skills apparently. Um... <laughs> so, Rich, are you feeling the unity, or uh, you know, what are your what's your perspective on this? Well, so uh, there's a reason why unity and unicorns have the same prefix. <laughs> They're very rarely seen, uh, in particular in Washington. You're lucky if you get unity in you know within the parties. Um, but that said, um, we you know we could see compromise, and I think that, I think we that would be that would be acceptable. And compromise has a name in Washington, and it's not Joe Biden, it's Joe Manchin, uh, you know, who for those of you who aren't Senate geeks is, a, is the senior senator from West Virginia and a, and a fairly conservative Democrat who, who might be one of those who can uh, bring the reality of the, of the compromise that's needed to the table. Um, but again, that'll come down to, to uh, how, how, uh, how those negotiations go. But no, I, I, um, I think I think it's a sad fact that that politicians are rewarded far more for conflict than they are for agreement, 
And, you know, that's on the voters, right? The voters need to, need to start uh, rewarding other behaviors. But, but, but that said, you know, coming out of a crisis that was in everybody's, everybody's uh, homes and lives, uh, the tolerance for, uh, for actually getting things done uh, hopefully is, uh, is better than it's ever been. Yeah, um, actually, let me, uh, Ryan, any, you wanna chime in on, on unity? Sure. I mean, there's a lot to agree with there. The unity unicorns thing. I'm stealing. We're that. unified. Um, <laughs> um, but everyone raises great points. I am to say I'm a skeptical of the public opinion is bipartisan if Republican and Democrat voters agree with it. And that counts sort of line of thinking that the Biden administration has adopted is part of the reason that I sound like such a skeptic, which I'm generally not. I'm usually an optimist, but I don't see that approach working for legislation down the line. And, you know, like Rich said, Joe Manchin is sitting there at the pivot point, but there's also this problem solvers caucus, because at the end of the day, you need to get 10, really, if you want to overcome the filibuster. And that requires good faith argumentation. And like Rich also said, is good faith argumentation working towards compromise what voters are looking for? I really think that COVID was unique in that all of us really felt our lives were impacted. I really think there's some truth to this unmooring of the American voter from a real reality that's grounded in, okay, we really need to help each other. COVID really, I mean, COVID should have been a unifying thing. I, I actually ended up, it ended up being extremely politicized, but I think at the end of the day, everyone did acknowledge that we needed help. I mean, that's why Trump, we're talking about Trump passed the CARES Act. That, I mean, the largest you know, piece of legislation in terms of monetary value that really the government had ever seen passed under a Republican president with Mitch McConnell guiding it through. The, you know, that was the level of crisis um, and that's what it took. And I don't think that when we, now that we're starting to peel off of that and vaccinations are going well, I'm starting to see people return to old habits and old ways of thinking. If, is it serving me? Is it not serving me? Um, and I'm wondering how that's gonna work on the Hill. So I'm a little bit skeptical of whether Biden's really gonna be able to muster it together. My hope, this is, I won't give a prediction, but if he can get some kind of compromise on infrastructure, that will bode really well, I think, down the line. If infrastructure ends up being reconciliation, then I don't see how you get some of the tougher Voting Rights Act, for example, through uh, the Senate without some big changes. So that's sort of where I'm at. I think it's an interesting perspective, but will it work? I'm not confident. So I, I'll just reference back to, I don't want to put words in Ella's mouth, but it's related to what Ella said, which was, I, I mean, I do think that the Biden administration is may end up making a calculation. It sounds like people on the Hill are making the calculation or Democrats are, the Republicans aren't really serious about play. And I, I, I'm not voicing an opinion on that. I'm just like, I think, and so they're testing the waters on that, you know, and, and I think that like, if they, and so they're, if they may end up making a calculation of that. And so kind of, if that's true, they don't want to waste a lot of time. And they're just going to like, at that point, they're just going to, you know, give up and just, go to the voters, basically. And I think that the theory is that if they do a bunch of really popular stuff without Republicans, that'll start and that'll start putting heat on Republicans to come to the table. Now, I don't know if that's works, if that's the, you know, if that's all true, but I think that's the thinking that could lead to jamming, you know, infrastructure through reconciliation. Um, we had, let's see, which one of these, we've get, we're getting some excellent questions. Well, I'm not asking that one because you shouldn't use words like that. Um, uh, uh, it's a family program, people. Um, so this is one specifically for Rich. It's a it's a good uh, thing that one of one of by part of Biden's infrastructure uh, plan relates to critical industries such as semiconductors. And um, uh, could you sort of comment on you know what the Biden plan is and sort of whether any you know what else is needed, just some perspective on that, and maybe a little bit on the global clip, uh, chip shortage issue, which has come up. Yeah, so that's a great example of where, where well, I like, I, I like to invoke Eisenhower's, he was attributed the saying that, that, that uh, plans are worthless, but planning is essential. And, you know, 
it was not in their plan to have uh, automobiles slow down, automakers slow down their production right during COVID, uh, largely because they couldn't get the semiconductors that they needed. And that's exactly what's happened. Ford, Chevy, Toyota, they all had to slow down. They weren't expecting that. That's an example of where they use summit politics. They had a summit meeting, they brought everybody in, they broadened the issue beyond semiconductors to include other things like, like uh, electric batteries and, and, uh, and critical minerals and, 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 and other issues. And, and again, it was masterfully handled because no problems got solved, but they were talked about in a way that I think gave people the confidence that something will get done. Fact of the matter is the reason why why um, semiconductors are so critical. All you have to do is think about it in terms of oil in the 70s. It's a commodity that everybody uses, you know, oil, make gas, it's in your cars, in your homes, yet it was this massive national security asset. Semiconductors are the same thing. And if you had to pick one area of strategic competition between China and the United States, it's semiconductors. The US has a lead, but China wants it. And that is one of the issues they're gonna have to grapple with. The, the answer that's being talked about is more money. Uh, and I think there's a fair amount of skepticism over that actually solving a particular issue like the chip shortage that's, that's being experienced. Um, and in fact, it's a little bit concerning because that is the China approach. China dumps tons and tons of money into industries that they care about um, but that's often at the, at the uh, sacrifice of good old fashioned innovation, competition, all the things that make the American ecosystem so successful. So that is, that's, that's one that the Biden administration says that you know, they're gonna study along with a larger China policy and come up with some recommendations, but we really don't know where that's gonna come down. Have you looked at what, is, are there any specifics in the job plan about this or? or so legislation was passed last year, actually called the CHIPS Act. And it was designed to throw a little bit of money at some programs um, to, to you know, really, really kind of bolster the industry a little bit. Um, the, the, the issue though is the American lead was achieved by companies all over this United States, some you've heard of, some you haven't, who invested their revenues like crazy to stay ahead. And the government actually can't compete with that. Uh, and it's something that the government probably needs to think about because government investment in R&D has come down four times. By that, I mean by a factor of four over the past 50 years and it has been more than replaced by private sector innovation. So that's where, that's where the real advancements are coming from. And, and my only advice to any administration is first do no harm. You know, we don't wanna do anything that's gonna shackle American innovation that's, that's emerging from all that investment. Great. Um, what, another question is, and I'll, I'll throw this to Ella, um, uh, something I've spent a bunch of time on, um, but the, so, you know, we've got a couple of trillion for the, you know, we have the trillions that were spent last year. We got a couple of trillion in the rescue plan. We got a couple of trillion in the jobs, uh, you know, American jobs plan. We've got maybe another couple trillion or a little less in the American family plan. Okay, so like, you know, a trillion here, a trillion there, you're eventually talking about real money. And uh, is there, any, do you have any, like, how is the administration positioning itself for the, you know, criticism they're going to get really from broader than just Republicans on, on sort of on the level of debt that's being, I mean, some of this is paid for in terms of uh, they have tax proposals, but sort of how are they girding themselves for both the deficit debate and the tax debate, I guess would be my question. Yeah, I mean, how they're girding themselves for the tax debate is starting out by, uh, you know, proposing taxes on corporations and the wealthy, <laughs> which are, are popular uh, measures. Um, and I mean, this is, this is also the crux of the disagreement between Republicans and Democrats on Capitol Hill, um, because, you know, Republicans say, you know, certainly by the, the provision um, to fund the American Jobs Plan, the main provision to fund the American Jobs Plan was a proposal to raise the corporate tax rate to 28%, um, thereby undoing one of the key parts of the 2017 GOP tax cut bill, which is sort of, you know, like the crown jewel of the 
GOP in the Trump era, their signature bill. So right away when, you know, the Biden administration proposed raising that, Republicans, you know, essentially said no way. But at the same time, you know, this political argument that, you know, essentially that that has been, um, you know, <laughs> said by War um, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders and, you know, now uh, maybe kind of strangely, you wouldn't necessarily think that after the Democratic primary by Joe Biden um, is, is, you know, that essentially why should, you know, why shouldn't corporations pay their fair share so that you can, um, you know, you middle class person can, can, you uh, um, go to community college tuition free and, you know, have this infrastructure and, um, uh, you know, all, all of these other things. So that is, that is one thing. Um, the other thing that the New York Times um, reported, first reported yesterday, is that the Biden administration is essentially um, part of the way that it wants to fund it's this next plan that's going up is to essentially just give more money to the IRS so that they can go after people who don't pay their taxes um, and just really try to, in addition to, you know, other uh, raising taxes on, uh, you know, capital gains or, or um, wealthier people in the United States, also just going after people who don't pay their taxes to try to sort of close some loopholes um, and, and add more revenue that way. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely, um, I was talking to uh, a pollster just today about, um, you know, that deficit spending is, is definitely not popular compared to raising um, taxes on corporations and the wealthy. Um, and, and that's going to be an interesting thing to, to see play out in sort of the public debate versus the debate on Capitol Hill. I think that that is like something where the debates are uh, very different. Yeah, it'll be, I mean, I was going to ask you, but you sort of got to it about, you know, where the deficits and debt um, come into this. I mean, I, it, it feels like the, the debate is less sharp on that than it has been in the past, I think in part because we've, you know, people keep saying, oh my God, we've got more debt and saying interest rates are going to spike, we have inflation, all this bad stuff's going to happen, and it hasn't. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, past performance may not be indicative of future results, right? So that doesn't mean there isn't some limit on how much debt you can accrue that, that starts causing problems, but it sort of does seem like damp and it's interesting to hear you say that about the polling because I'd sort of been assuming that the polling wasn't as strong as it's been in the past because really the Republicans haven't been hammering and hammering on that the way you might have expected. I mean, Rich, you know, you've been involved in these kinds of discussions. Uh, you know, what's your perspective on this? Yeah, boy, I couldn't agree more that the, that the urgency over dealing with our debt um, uh, has, is, seems to be in the rearview mirror. And, you know, Look, this is a, this is an issue that doesn't lend itself well to populism. Um, uh, it's just good good budgeting. The service we pay on the debt, it's like anyone else's credit card. That's the largest single federal program, the interest we pay on our debt. It would be good to not have to spend that money. Um, but having said that, we had a pandemic. And the, the real question for us is, we had a pandemic. That doesn't mean we're not going to have another one or some other anticipated thing that will do a cannonball in our financial pool. And that's what, what, what I am concerned about and why some eye towards fiscal discipline uh, really needs to, be, needs to be implemented here. But it's not, it's not gonna be for partisan political gain because nobody gets that. It's gonna have to be just responsible leadership. Yeah, and it's interesting that they are for the stuff going ahead, looking to, to raise taxes to, to, to pay for it. Um, I mean, it, it, you know, it'll be interesting to see if uh, in the past, sometimes we've seen proposals start like that and then some smoke and mirrors start going on. And, and so the numbers don't quite add up, but um, we'll see how that develops. Um, so uh, uh, L is on deadline and we're at time. Um, I thought we'd maybe go once around the room and uh, see if people will have any uh, closing thoughts. I wanna ask you for predictions of the future exactly, but if you do have any thoughts on, um, you know, kind of what the first hundred days might have told us that wouldn't have been obvious, I guess, um, uh, you know, prior to the, you know, prior to, to uh, President Biden being nominated. I mean, I'll just start with mine really quickly, which is I didn't expect him to, to push this hard for this ambitious of an agenda this fast. So that's mine. Um, Ellen, any closing thoughts or thoughts on that? 
Well, yeah, I agree that it's, um, I think that he's been, um, you know, extremely active. He's also changed the tenor of our relationship to the president, it seems to me, that we're, there's a, you know, we're not, uh, the world isn't turning on a tweet and, uh, you know, the constant barrage of uh, static noise out of the White House, it seems to me, has been reduced dramatically and replaced by some real action or efforts in that direction. So uh, the mood of the country, I think, has shifted a bit. You know, people are apprehensive, understandably so. I mean, many Americans have lived through the worst year of their life over the last year. And uh, there's been a tremendous degree of suffering. And I think that, uh, you know, there's an appropriately somber uh, mood, but, uh, you know, uh, feeling that things have, have sort of stabilized from, from where we were. So I see the, all of those as positives. And uh, I'm disappointed that uh, the uh, Republican Party has, uh, so many Republicans, I should say, have taken such an oppositional uh, position. I guess it was predictable enough, but, um, you know, as uh, my colleagues here have said tonight, uh, the unity is elusive and conflict is omnipresent. And where the American people fall and all of that, I'm afraid, you know, through the cracks uh, is uh, very, very worrisome. Ella. Um, I would agree with you, Michael, that I'm um, just generally very interested in Biden's policy agenda and how bold he's going. I also am really fascinated to see um, Biden's political identity continue to play out. And it is really fascinating that, you know, he is, um, he is proposing these very, very unabashedly progressive pieces of legislation. Um, but at the same time, I think that majority of viewers still view him as pretty moderate, just given his long history. And so I'm really interested to sort of see kind of where he, um, you know, ends up sitting in the Democratic Party and what the future of the party um, looks like under him, um, you know, given the, the tussling between moderate and uh, progressive Democrats that we've seen. Yeah, I, I read someone wrote that Obama pushed moderate policies and made them sound radical. And, and, you know, Biden's pushing this incredibly aggressive agenda and making it sound moderate. So, um, Ryan. Hey, well, so my surprise so far was the lack of Kamala Harris visibility, I think. I think when he got her to be the running mate and they got elected, there was uh, a lot I was expecting, I think, especially with racial reckoning being so high on the list. But this leads into my 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 prediction because I will give a prediction, and it's similar to you know, Michael. You made this point. You're surprised by the ambition of Biden so early. Well, I'm not because I think he's going to be a one-term president, and I don't think it's going to be because of the election. I don't think he's going to want to run again, and I think he's going to try to push out as many LBJ, FDR-like policies as early as possible to, to stamp a legacy in four years and, and pass it on. So my prediction is in 2024, it's not Biden on the ticket, but I think that for the first 100 days, we are seeing that level of explosion in policy, and I'm, I'm really excited to see where it goes. I know I've been a downer for a lot of today, but I really think that there's a lot of really amazing, potentially like century changing legislation that's happening right now at the beginning of our 2020s. And I'm, I'm excited to see how that plays out. Rich, we'll give you the last word, sir. Yeah, thanks, uh, Michael. And again, it's great to be with, with everybody, Ryan and Ellen, Ellen and of course you. I, I uh, So j just two quick comments. Before I came here tonight, I performed a little exercise, not wanting to um, rely on my own opinion. I did this kind of a quick word association focus group with a bunch of people in town, movers and shakers, all different parties, et cetera. And I asked them one word, you know, what word do you associate with, with, um, with uh, President Biden's first 100 days? And, and the overwhelming word that came up first was, was discipline. Uh, and, I, and I think part of that was that he was always viewed as being an undisciplined stump 
politician. And so maybe there's some contrast there, but certainly we're seeing some reality to it. The other one is energetic, which I think, you know, echoes a lot of what's being said uh, here, here tonight. As far as what's going forward, the thing that I'm most interested, interested in, and I think this has a lot to do with my own background, having gotten started in the Senate, is how Joe Biden and Mitch McConnell uh, will work together. Two Senate war horses who defined their careers by, by you know, accomplishing things uh, in the Senate. And I, I think if we have uh, an agenda that's disciplined, energetic, and two war horses that are willing to work stuff out, that adds up to a fairly optimistic view of the future. Well, I, uh, I think we, uh, we welcome the optimism. We'll hope for the best. Um, I just want to e extend my thanks on behalf of all our audience who joined in. We got a nice, good turnout. And uh, uh, thank you very much for taking the time. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you. Good night. I enjoyed it. Having us. Thank you all. It was great to meet you.